This is Health Unabashed broadcasting live on Healthcare Now Radio. Health Unabashed is a conversational platform where healthcare meets innovation. We engage top industry talent and dive into the heart of health and wellness from vision to business model to bring you the latest developments in health tech from promising AI applications, policy, to ultimately meaningful impact on the public's health and well-being. I'm Greg Masters, co-host and executive producer, and I'm joined by the digital health aficionado himself, author, editor, global thought leader, and in his executive capacity, steward servant, Gil Bash. Together, we're on a mission to bring you the people, the ideas, and the companies that are not just talking the talk, but walking the talk. On today's menu, we're in the company of Zachary Fink, CEO and co-founder of Vitrack Health, a company committed to increasing access to care for all through encrypted digital health care, empowering individuals and clinicians to view their responsibility and role in health care via technology-leveraged innovation. Through a proprietary set of solutions that turns data into story, Vitrek supports the transformation of a system of reactive sick care to one of proactive well care. So with no further delay, Gil, the mic is yours. Greg, I'm, I want to thank you once again for the gracious introduction. I also want to remind our listeners that they should tune into Pop Health Week that you and Fred Goldstein co-host. Um, and I just want to say to our listeners why I think it's important for you to listen to Pop Health Week. Now, first of all, I have to say, if you have only one health radio show to listen into, obviously, of course, <laughs> Health Unabashed. But if you have two shows that time permits, definitely include Pop Health Week as the second show. Just before we went on air, uh, I was speaking with Greg and, and my guest, who I'll introduce in a second. Um, we were We were talking a little bit about obviously something that I think is a grave concern here, which is we were talking about, you know, sort of follow through over time with people who have chronic conditions. And the fact that the life of a relationship with a health insurance plan is at three to five years. And, and the problem is that doesn't incentivize the insurance plan to really lean into proactively keeping you healthy or intervening around your disease. It it kind of makes them shrug their shoulders and hope that you don't die or get really sick. You can die in someone else's insurance plan, but just don't get really sick on their watch. Um, you know, Greg, who's been involved in public health on the grassroots level for quite some time, really is very sensitized to that. We were just talking about how uh, Kaiser, Kaiser Health, uh, obviously has a 15-year-plus relationship with its customers, with its beneficiaries, and how that creates a very different mindset. And that leads us to today's great program. I have a, a guest who's been on before. I follow him very closely. I really love his persistence, his res resilience, and, and how he actually has been taking remote patient monitoring and really being part of the transformation of an idea and a technology. We have with us today, Zachary Fink. And Zachary is the founder um, and um, really one of the, I would say the creative geniuses behind um, Vitrek. And Vitrek, I, I had the chance to download it onto my, my phone. I watch it. The, the early, I guess it was a few years ago, you know, sort of like genius factor that Zach and team added to remote patient monitoring was it was facial. And that through using facial technology, which is a given today, he was able to actually assess stress levels, even blood pressure levels, pulse levels, and all that. And so it was a great tool for people who are not necessarily tech savvy um, or people who might be actually tech uh, disadvantaged in places where there's tech um, disparities of use. And I use it, not that I'm tech you know, disadvantaged or savvy, I'm not. i actually very good with technology, but it's a pleasure to see how new technologies come online. Um, since that time, um, he hasn't put that aside. He's just he let it evolve to a whole different level. And I had a chance a few weeks ago to be invited behind the curtain to see what he and his development folks are doing in terms of shifting remote patient monitoring to 
I, I don't know if it will be called remote patient monitoring any longer in the future. <laughs> I think it's probably going to be um, part of an interventional strategy. Uh, Zachary has had sort of a passion for health and medicine from his early years. I think your dad's a doc. He is. He is. Yeah. And he kept his license. He still you. has it active. He's doing he great. You and the family. Yeah, he's actually a Vitrec client, which oh, is really okay. exciting. Okay. I get my best feedback from him because he uh, doesn't soften okay. any of it. So there yeah. you go. So so he has a built-in focus group <laughs> yes. for the company. <laughs> who, is, who obviously, it's it's my son. He runs around <laughs> to the community saying, look what my son did, probably. Pretty much, yeah. He, he gets a lot of uh, nachas from it. Okay, him. very <laughs> good. It's good to get sort of a sense of pride from, yes. from your from your kinder, from your children, yes. right? Exactly. So um, uh, Zachary also has a sister who is a nurse. So obviously medicine was the conversation around the breakfast table. Um, uh, Zachary actually trained and was an EMT, um, very passionate about that, and did consider a career in medicine following his father's footsteps, except, of course, the sight of blood really disturbed him. <laughs> So he went into remote patient monitoring, where he's as far away as possible from the patient. Yeah. From the patient, no, yeah. no, 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 that's not true. So, so I, I wanted to explore this, and uh, you know, exactly, we were talking just before we went on air about this article I wrote recently about diabetes and people who are um, obese and are pre-diabetic and their predisposition to graduate, sadly, to type two diabetes, and are our nation's perspective about prevention of obesity and type 2 diabetes by investing in our children's well-being, um, obviously food education, obviously providing healthy lunches at school, obviously making the, um, the government programs that provide for families who are really stressed financially, making it easier for them to purchase affordable, healthy foods. All of that is difficult in this country. So that leads us to a sick care system. And with a sick care system where people are presenting with, well, chronic illness, where they see their internist primary care doctor every six months if they're adherent, um, it's not working. No, <laughs> no, no, it's not working. So I, I wanted to explore a little bit with you the the early concept you had four years ago, five years ago with Vitrack with remote patient monitoring, how it worked, and why you made the quantum leap to interventional care using technology. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because remote patient monitoring kind of was in favor. Um, internists, family practice medicine saw it as an add-on. Maybe they could, there was maybe as a there's a code for that, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and they could build to that. So obviously you had a booming business and then you decided that's not enough. Yeah. I really want to prevent disease um, and, and not be part of the sick care system. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on. Sure. So first of all, thank you so much for having me on the show. Always a pleasure to be here. You know, a lot of the idea for when I switched my career, so I did make it into medical school. I made it about six months before I dropped out to start Vitrack. And the reason I dropped out was because I got a very firsthand look at how broken the healthcare system was. They, When you're in med school, they'll do what's called case-based learning. Well, they're I'll give you a case and treat you like a detective and say, hey, solve this case. And so every time they'd ask me to solve a case or someone present a case, I had the same question every single day, which was this. How did the patient get this bad? This is their fifth diabetic ulcer. This is their third heart attack. And the answer became so obvious. It was because nobody's watching this patient. We're just waiting for folks to get really sick, for that individual to decide when they're sick enough to show up in the physician's office, to show up in the ER. And previous, before I went to medical school, I was doing a lot of work in disaster relief communities, um, communities hit by disasters, and setting up rural healthcare clinics for those impacted by the long-term effects of a disaster. And I realized the same tools I was implementing there could solve so much of what was happening in healthcare. The, so I started pitching this to people, and everyone kept saying the same thing to me, which was, this is a great idea. We should do this, but who's going to pay for it? And I kept saying, well, we should, everyone should pay for this because it's the right way to move healthcare. And that wasn't good enough until, to Medicare's credit, which I feel like people rarely give them, they created a set of codes that actually incentivized doing this level of proactive care. So from that, we started a company and we started 
thinking about this, this thought problem, right, which is this, is that if we now can monitor these vital signs daily and catch that what we call the critical moment when somebody's healthcare goes into a direction that it shouldn't be going in, and if we can identify that moment, what is then our responsibility to not only act on that moment, to provide the tools needed to catch that moment to everybody? right, regardless of your chronic condition, regardless of if you're 95 and not very great at using your technology or don't have an iPhone or even Wi-Fi, all the way to somebody who wants the most cutting edge thing that exists. So I would say for the first good bit of Vitrack, I was almost obsessed with what types of technology can I leverage to gather as much information from a patient as possible. And that ended up being really unique problems to solve. For example, if I have someone really elderly, you can't use technology, no, no smartphone, no computer, no Wi-Fi. What we ended up doing was putting SIM cards inside of medical devices, which means there's nothing to download. All you got to do is press start, use the cell signal down to dashboard all the way, like you said, to gathering vitals directly from a smartphone, which is interesting you brought that up because as of last week, we have a brand new feature where you can cough into your iPhone microphone for about 10 seconds on that sample, we can give you a band of likeliness of what respiratory condition you might be going through. And we've got a lot of other really incredible things that we have on our roadmap that Gil has seen. But like you said, we were gathering all these vital signs, all these data points, right? And what we realized is what makes that data point useful is somebody's interaction with it. It's the intervention based on that. So getting a red alert from a blood pressure is in itself not useful. What's useful is somebody seeing that and responding to it and making an intervention. So what I've spent the last few years obsessing over is moving health systems, like you said, first from reactive to proactive. And I think we're doing an incredible job at that. But now where we're pushing the envelope even further is from proactive to predictive. And I think once you start doing that, you you brought up the case of diabetes, right? right, right. My little brother was recently diagnosed and... I did a deep dive into that, just really understanding all the pieces, how all the flow of his care of the diagnosis of understanding and the intervention, all the types of medications that he needs. And I realized so much of that, if you catch it early, if you start to catch these things as they're arising, you don't even need to get into proactive care because what we're doing is beyond that, it's predictive. It's seeing if we can catch this even earlier and intervene there. And I think that's the key to healthcare with all this data, with the AI, the machine learning, the natural language processing, that's now at our fingertips. It's all out there. What's our responsibility to harness that technology to save as many lives as possible through predictive modeling? Just dropping in, you're right on time for Health Unabashed on Healthcare Now Radio. Today, we're chatting with Zachary Fink, CEO and co-founder of Vitrack Health, a company committed to increasing access to care for all through encrypted digital healthcare solutions. Stay tuned for the rest of the story. You know, uh, this is such a, a sort of important insights because when we have the um, policy debates on health, and we look at the $4 trillion that this country invests spending on health, um, only 11% of that is actually on drugs. You know, people assume when they hear $4 trillion and we hear um, like sort of the people from the Senate complaining about the cost of care, and we see that drug companies are seated in front of a Senate um, you know, sort of health and finance being grilled, the, the natural is sort of uh, assumption is that the villain is the pharmaceutical company. And then when we actually have any knowledge and we realize it's 11% is drugs and that the use of a drug in many cases spares the system from hospitalization, which is 52% of the spend is on hospitalization. So and that's not to say that we shouldn't give hospitals money, heaven forbid, but we've got to ask ourselves to the question you asked, why are these people getting so bad? And, you know, I think that to some extent, when we take a look at doctors, and Greg, you've experienced this, doctors in terms of their technology training, even basic technology that, you know, Zach, you and, and your company are offering, they get maybe, maybe a, a day um, of, of technological training during medical school, and yet all of these technological patient support advances, or at least tools are being developed that would enable the doctor or the doctor's staff, physician's assistant, nurse assistants, to be more on top of the patient's 
urgencies rather than waiting for the middle of the night call that they're in the ER and come and visit your patient. So I'm just wondering, you know, I, I, I really appreciate your passion for the evolution, the transformation of these technologies and making them easier to use, better in terms of the insights provided and a platform for interventional or predictive care. What's, it seems so obvious, What's the problem? It's a, it's a good question. And just what you brought up about medical school, something that that I heard from you that sits with me every day as we're going through these thought exercises is this, is that healthcare is not what happens when you're in front of your doctor. It's not what happens when you're in the hospital, right? Healthcare is every single day. It's when you wake up in the morning. It's when you go to sleep. The problem is the way we're doing our trainings in medical school, the way that even healthcare is thought about is healthcare is only what happens when you're in front of a physician. And because of that, we only care about our healthcare when we're in front of a physician. And that's what makes the model so problematic. That's what makes it so reactive. If we can change our thinking from a policy perspective all the way down to an individual person perspective, that every day healthcare is what we're going to need to truly keep you healthy, that daily monitoring, taking your vital signs, taking your medication, answering questionnaires as they're asked of you by your physician. As we do that more and we put the onus on the physician and the patient to do their jobs better, right? It's, if you go on our website, the first thing you'll see is in big, bold words, the standard of care has changed. Now that that's happened, what's our responsibility here, right? That's the question that I love to bring up over and over is as physicians and as patients, as patients demand that our doctors take better care of us by taking care of us every single day, not just when we get really sick. Uh, there's, there's an interesting twist to all this. And you know, I, I recently was notified by my primary care physician that she's retiring. She's at a much younger age. And uh, she said to me, I, I just can't make money in in uh, practicing medicine any longer. The upkeep of the office, the staff, the paperwork, the, the reimbursement level, it doesn't pay any longer. And so on one hand, I always ask people, how much do you think the average physicians, the average physician's salary is at the beginning of the year? Like what's their set salary? And people don't realize, you know what their set salary is at the beginning of the year? Zero, because it's a pay, it's a fee for service business. So they have to have patients coming in they have to code those patients for what they're doing, and they get reimbursed a reasonable rate dictated by the payer. And so you have to see a lot of patients and have the right coding in order to make some money here. So the, the, the question I always have is, what is stopping the system from making a transformation toward preventive care or interventional care, um, predictive care, I, I think the real issue is uh, financial alignment. So I, I know that this is a question that you've raised before, which is not just how do you invent um, something that is you know, embraced as innovation that they want to apply, but you've been very careful in the past to explain to your provider base that this is something that they can make money from. Is that correct? Completely correct. So if you think about when you go to your doctor, right, for a visit, the way that it works is depending on a specific event that occur occurred or a specific procedure, the doctor gets reimbursed X amount, right? So to give you an example, the doctor saw you specifically for a 15 minute increment, exactly. He will get or she will get reimbursed a certain amount. Now that's a completely broken system. Uh, again, the intention is that in the course of your usual care, you will make X, Y, and Z based on these things that occurred, but that's not what's happening. I like to think of a metaphor of a bakery, right? Let's say to knead the dough, we're going to give you $1, right? To put on the sprinkles, we'll give you another dollar. But to, uh, let's say, put the icing on, we'll give you $10. What does that say? I'm going to spend so much more time just focusing on icing, and then the rest is going to get lost in the mix. We're not going to get a great product, but we'll have perfect icing. That's a little bit of the problem with healthcare today is the way that these CPT codes or the reimbursable opportunities are, are completely misaligned 
with giving actually good care. It's do X generate revenue of Y. Now, to their benefit, sometimes they do get this equation right. So for what we are providing, this level of proactive care, they are actually reimbursing physicians pretty well. And if you kind of get to the bottom of this, not not so deep in this podcast, but you're looking at about $120 per patient per month if you're doing this really, really well. Now, again, I have some issues with how Medicare has actually defined what is good proactive care. Uh, it's very arbitrary. And in fact, I worked my way up to the top of the tree and asked, oh, mighty wizard behind the curtain, how did you decide that 16 readings in 30 days is good adherence or 20 minutes is enough time to monitor a patient a month? Where did this come from? And the person who actually wrote the codes <laughs> said, we saw something similar in another set of codes we had. So we figured eh, it probably applies here. And that was that. And I, it just really shattered me <laughs> thinking about, I spent all day trying to make sure that physicians are generating revenue for providing better care. So is the system broken? Yes. But if we can take that system and again, harness it in a way that makes a physician focus way more on that day-to-day -day care than particular codes that are being generated in the office, I think that's how we fix it. And you know, something that we spoke about is telehealth calls, right? Why do we see a huge decrease in telehealth calls or physicians refusing to get on telehealth calls? Well, it's not rocket science. You ready? I'm gonna, gonna give you the answer here. A physician makes way more money because of the reimbursable opportunities that exist when you go and get in your car, sit in traffic, get to their office. And then all the things that happen in office, they're going to make way more money on that visit than they would on just the telehealth call you needed. Again, incentives are completely misaligned. Yeah, this is the part where, you know, we sometimes say the system is broken. And the, the, the system may not be really broken. It's just that there are so many players where one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing. And I think it's totally fragmented. So, you know, you have shifts coming in and out. You have nurses who spend three days on a floor working with the same group of patients. Then they leave. Another group of nurses come in, and they're starting from ground zero on the knowledge level. And, you know, they don't know if a patient's improved or declined. You know, they just you know, come in. They say anything going on. The nurse says, no, I got to go. The other one says, I got to go. One comes in and they're starting from ground zero. The yeah. patient's starting, in essence, from ground zero. These these CPT codes that are written, this looks like that, I'll do that, is an example of there is no clear central objectives that say um, what we're really seeking to do is improve people's lives and outcomes. Let's structure the system from what's most vital and important to that. So if we were to say, look, everybody's in the system. Everybody has health insurance, right? We're all beneficiaries of something. And so when you look at it, the if for a plan to say, hey, I've got you know, X amount of people who are healthy without illness, it pays for me to invest in keeping them healthy, right? This way, I don't have to lay out any money for them. And I can provide added service, make them happy, feel that I'm listening, helping. And they're not sick. And I don't have to sort of take care of their hospitalization and added drug costs. For people who are ill with chronic illness, where it's possible to return them to a state of health, we should focus on that. Um, but we don't. So I want to go back to the core aspect for a second of what you're doing. It's hard for me to believe that that um, that this show, this 30-minute show goes so quickly. <laughs> it does. And yet it it does. That's the yeah. that's what or or our 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 production team, our executive producer, Greg Masters, runs the clock much faster on me than he does <laughs> on others. I don't know. We're gonna have to find out. But let's be predictive for a second. I, I've seen this this new tool you have, the dashboard, which allows almost the system to synthesize data and actually give doctors a heads up on where they need to be focused. It almost uses some form of augmented intelligence to sort of filter up, here's all the patients in your practice, here's the ones you really need to get on the stick about. Yep. Um, so it's for doctors who are using your system, it's aggregating the data, it's sorting through the data, it's prioritizing the data, and then it's directing the doctor's practice to get on the ball. Yeah. Uh, is that basically that, it? That's exactly it, because I, I saw a gap truly forming in the industry. I saw almost all of the investment in medical innovation going toward diagnosis, telling the physician or the nurse, 
hey, the patient has X, Y, or Z. And one thing I've learned is physicians and nurses hate nothing more when, than when you tell them this is what the diagnosis is. And I realized that they don't need help on diagnosis. What they need help on is prioritizing and triaging the data and having suggested workflows. In response to X, what might our system or our intelligence say you should do next, right? So it's it's also understanding that my hope, again, I'm a huge optimist, Gil can tell you, more systems and physician's offices are switching every day to a proactive version of care. What does that mean? We're going to start generating thousands, tens of thousands, millions, and then billions of data points in service of proactive care. Think of all the vitals readings, the questionnaires, the appointment requests, the cough analysis, you name it. How can I create an algorithm to sort through those millions and billions of data points, bring the most important one to the top, and then the next one, and suggest workflows based off of those? This is this is great. Now, Zach, you've been with this for quite some time. You know, the remote patient monitoring really became the the buzzword during obviously COVID and then decentralized clinical trials yeah. and people saw this, but you're bringing it to the space of public health and predictive public health, which I think considering the data we have and the ability to really read data rapidly and apply that that's the way to go. What's just very quickly as we're wrapping up, yeah. what's the, what's the next big thing we can expect from you and Vitrek? So the first thing I'd like to do before I go is I know we've been talking about how the health system is doom and gloom, but, and I don't want you to feel jaded. A lot of my perspective on the health system comes from my time living in Uganda. We were out there volunteering, living in the bush. And I remember I was walking to the work site one day and we saw a black mamba snake in the middle of the road. And I said, what happens if you get bit by that snake? And I said, one of two things happen. You live or you die. There's no ambulance. There's no doctor. There's no hospital. And coming back to the U.S., we have problems with our system, but I hope you realize what an amazing country we live in that we have a system that you can call an ambulance almost anywhere and still get care. So where do I see all this going? From what I've seen in the industry, only optimism, only getting better, pushing data and models and AI forward. And I don't think we have any other choice. It's inevitable that we'll get there. And I hope I'm lucky enough to be one of the people that really pushes that needle. And not bitten by a snake. And not bitten by a snake. snake. No. no. First of all, Zach, I, I know this is a, an unusual moment where we're actually um, recording a live show, both of us together in yeah. the same room. It's rare. Thank you very much for zooming up from Philly to join me here in New York City. Greg, as always, thank you for making this happen from California. And to our listeners, we thank you. Listen carefully. The future is not sick care. It's actually health care. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And that, dear listeners, is the last note for today's Melody. A huge thank you to our worldwide audience for tuning in. And a tip of the hat to our special guest, Zachary Fink, CEO and co-founder of Vitrek Health, a company committed to increasing access to care for all through encrypted digital health care, empowering individuals and clinicians to view their responsibility and role in health care via technology-leveraged innovation. Do follow Vitrack's work on the web via www.vitrack.com or on Twitter via at Vitrack Health. Health on a Bash streams live three times a day on Healthcare Now Radio Monday through Friday at 10.30 a.m., 6.30 p.m. and 2.30 a.m. Eastern and at 7.30 a.m., 9.30 p.m. and 11.30 p.m. Pacific. Do stay social with Gil and me on Twitter via at Gil underscore Bash, and that is B-A-S-H-E, and Greg Masters M-P-H, and that is Greg with two Gs. Don't forget to give your tweets some zing with our hashtag, Health Unabashed. Until we meet again, pursue your passion for better health and with no apologies.